Are you a brew head? I'm a brew head. Are you a brew head? I'm a brew head. Y'all a brew heads? Yeah, we brew heads. So pour a glass of craft beer. We can do this. Yeah. What's good, y'all? This is C-Certified Brewhead. Welcome to episode 148 of Beer Another Sugar Podcast. This afternoon, we are in glorious Norfolk, Virginia, with Kevin, co-founder of O'Connor. Mate, thank you for having us. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me. Great to be here. Yeah. First time in the area. It's beautiful weather. This weather's crazy. It it's is like a, a heat, hair dryer. No, it's a heat wave right now. Yeah? How do you feel about it as a... Uh, are you Virginian? Oh, born and raised yeah. right here. Yeah. How do, you, how do you deal with this? Um, It's not this bad every year. No? No. This is really bad? This is really bad. Okay. I think it's been... It's supposed to go on for like another week for 110, 115 degree weather. So, yeah, I haven't felt anything like we were just in Jamaica like a week and a half ago. I'm not even it probably wasn't even like that this. bad. No, I'm not no. Like, it was pretty hot. Yeah, they were complaining. Well, Jamaica's were like, yeah. this is crazy. But I hadn't experienced like that. Like, I, I guess it's humidity, but it's like it's, it's all this, humidity here. But there's no cool breeze. Yeah. I think maybe here compared to say Richmond or even Alexandria with the the coastal breeze, maybe. I don't know. I mean, no. sometimes you get to Richmond in Charlottesville, they'll uh, it will feel like an oven. Just because the, yeah, the, you're not close it just to the, it just it yeah. literally gets stuck in the mountains, gets stuck in the valley, or whatever you want to call it. Down here, you know, we at least we have the the Chesapeake Bay wind. We'll have the Atlantic Ocean wind. Um, but right now, we're in the middle of the city, so right. So we're just confident. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just at least everywhere is air conditioned. I do respect that. Yeah. Like everyone has made sure that there's like plenty of like cool space. It has to be right. Yeah, and it's just uh, like I don't want to complain too much. We're in Canada and it gets pretty damn cold and it's a really rough winter. Yeah, so I don't want to be complaining during the summer. So you're just sucking it up, you know. Well, that's what everybody does here. They all start complaining <laughs> right <laughs> now, cold. waiting for winter, and then all of a sudden we'll have okay. that one 12 inch, 18 inch snow, and everybody right. freaks out and wants the summer to come back. <laughs> It's crazy. Everybody forgets so we so I know, quickly, right? so easily, yeah. so easily. We're all, you can't please us humans. That's right. Um, so, what are we drinking right now, bro? We're drinking uh, our proper lager. Yes. It's a Hella style lager, about four and a half percent alcohol. Real, just your for days like this. This is it's your everyday perfect. lawnmower beer. Yeah, so. lawnmower beer. Um, four and a half is great. What? Uh, and you said we were just talking about it before. You won a bunch of awards recently. Well, I guess not really awards, just more accolades. <laughs> um, <laughs> Pace Magazine uh, rated their number four. They did a blind tasting of 151 loggers throughout um, the nation. There was uh, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine tied it with uh, Firestone Locker in the Hellas category uh, for the for number one, which was great. And then, of course, Beer Street Journal called it simply fantastic. So that's something I'm very happy with. I can tell why. It's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Really good. Is this your, would you say it's your flagship at all? Or? It is now, it is on our flagship rotate or our flagship list, but it's only been out for about three months now. Oh, right. So yeah, it's, so it's a brand new right. beer. Yeah. How's it going? I guess it's going really the, good. People right are now. loving it. Yeah, and, people yeah. are drinking it. Uh, it's moving really well. Um, it's actually become the top spot here in the, uh, in the tasting room. Nice. But I think at the end of the day, I think, you know, when we were joking about this earlier, I think people are starting to get can get palate fatigue from IPAs all day long. Sometimes yeah. people just want a good damn beer and, yeah. and sit down with it. So I'm loving the uh, the trend that's moving towards like them called crispy yeah. boys, like the the lagers, dry hop lagers, oh, yeah. pilsers and stuff. It's like it is a, a nice and necessary uh, switch over. It, it yeah, get it, a bit old sometimes. Yeah, I just the same pace exactly. Like, I mean, the pastry stouts, the fruited sours, yeah. they're great. But like some just need to bring them back. Yeah. Um, so this stuff is good. So let's get into your story then, man. So how did you personally get into beer, and then how did that lead to this bad boy? Well, uh, you know, every typically like every brewer probably started out as a home brewer or the most part, dabbled yeah. in college stuff like that. Mine went a little bit earlier, I guess. Um, you know, I'm of Irish descent, so I was always drinking, I guess, and always having a little bit of fun. I think at the end of the day, it was my freshman year in college. Um, Underage ended up getting a uh, underage never never they never. Uh, ended up getting a um, actually a homebrew kit from the local bottle shop. I was going in there all the time, and uh, I, uh, I could tell you the whole story. I take up half this podcast. <laughs> Kenny Lefkowitz, okay, rest in peace. Kenny Lefkowitz is a great guy, um, but then he literally sat there and you know you keep buying all this good beer. Have you thought about making it? And I just said, I didn't even know you could do that. Right. And uh, so long story short, cooked my first few batches on a pot plate in my dorm room. Nice. Uh, and then we started brewing beer out uh, at a friend's apartment and just kept doing it. And uh, my actually that summer, I went, went to work for a brewery. Right. And like knew I and actually, yeah. Yeah. Actually, they paid me, which was great. Even better. But um, 
that's when I knew I loved it. You know, I you get too many people that come to you like, hey, I've always wanted to work for a brewery. And I'm telling you, it's not a glamorous job. You know, it's, it's hot, it's cold, it's production, yeah, it's manufacturing. Exactly. Yeah. Especially on days like this. I right, mean, and you have to be lifting heavy things yeah. and running around. And these things yeah. aren't exactly air conditioning with the tanks. And no, stuff. no. I mean, there's some of my friends that do that. And uh, a friend that air you... Air condition the... Yeah, a friend of mine <laughs> up in uh, Richmond that you went and saw. I'm not going to keep his name off this. But <laughs> he, is like, he even said, he's like, I'm definitely getting air conditioned because when I used to work for you, it was... Uh, Swamp oh, no. balls over here. Sorry about that. I put that on for on record. But. Hey man, don't worry. You say what you like. It's yeah. your platform. But it's uh, but he's right. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we look we're looking at air conditioning and and putting it in the whole facility, even on the brewery side, because okay. at the end of the day, if it make happy employees, productive employees, happy employees, creative employees, and things like that. No, that's a good point. Yeah. So, were you were you drinking craft before you uh, started um, home brewing? Or was yes. It, yeah. So, yeah. were you like? How long ago approximately was that? Like if this place is 10 years old, uh, so that would have been... probably like in the... Late 90s? So I... Uh, 93... Oh, jeez. You're like, oh, jeez. Um, yeah, oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, um, my all-time favorite, my go-to is still Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Um, if there is... If I'm in a backwoods town and it's the only thing on a bottle or anything like that, that's the, that's the beer I would pick and choose. Okay. Um, Sam Adams and things like that. Right. Um, That's pretty much the only option. But so yeah, right? I mean, I remember um, Scrimshaw from, uh, uh, and then Acme. There's all those West Coast breweries that were still selling over here. Um, there was actually a local pub where I grew up, uh, and it was uh, right down the street. And yes, I was in there underage, but it was uh, hey, one of those things it? that I was always the one drinking either a pint of Guinness or a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. So it was. Yeah, kind well, of the next like, next thing, and that was so, really the first craft beer bar around here. Right. So the, well, I mean, it's great that that even existed. Yeah. In the nineties, I mean, what like I, I assume then out of your friends, maybe was it like a bunch of you were doing, it or you just were pressing? There was there was about four or five of us that were real tight. We would go to like high school parties, you know, and right. things like that. With you'd still have your suitcase of Natty Light, you know, but um, you'd always have under under my arm. There's always a twelve pack of Sierra Nevada. So, Right. So then you would go to your, your buddy's house, you take the milk and eggs and move them to the side and stick it in the back of the refrigerator. And no one's going to steal it anyway. And no one's going to, everybody's going to think it's their dad's stuff. beer, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so then we would sit back and, yeah, you would beer bong some natural lights, you know. And, that's fun. Yeah, I, I wouldn't do it with like a craft like, beer. Yeah. <laughs> I've like, seen people do yeah, it. Like and, 12% uh, basis. Yeah, Can you imagine? I couldn't imagine. Well, You're talking him. about <laughs> diabetes right there. <laughs> Instantaneous, instantaneous. And, uh, so, I, what, what made you like do that then? Like, why, why were you drinking crafts? I just when, like. I guess I like the. Uh, I like. At the end of the day, I like the flavor. Uh, I think I, as I got more and more into craft beer, um, and again, this was during the first craft beer boom. Um, I was enamored, and I come from a, a long line of entrepreneurs. I was enamored of what you could actually make right. from the ground up. Right. Um, it's my, natural yeah, yeah, my family's, yeah. my dad's business was in retail, so we had uh, we were in the auto part uh, game. So we had uh, you know thirty five stores, and there was it was just your retail place that you would go to. And but I always joke I went from one white trash business to the next <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, but you know my dad works in the business; he's retired, but yet still my Helps CFO. Nice. So yeah. I love that man. That's he retired for a little bit, and he he still likes to work, so keeps my book straight and things like that. And he's, he's a, it's a great year to Ben, but you know instead of just being a retailer and you buy somebody else's product and you sell, I had this, I guess, innate want to create beer all the way through the marketing process, and then get it out to the consumer that way. Right. Uh, so I think that's what's so cool about this industry. Not only the camaraderie, and, and I mean, at the end of the day, it's just beer, right? And at the end of the day, we can all have a beer together. Right. But it's that it's that I get joy into hearing ideas from our production team, or hearing ideas from the tasting room team about, hey, what if we did this? And if I get excited, I think it really becomes a success. Right. Um, because then you try it. Yeah. Yeah. There's been a couple things that I didn't think were going to be successful, or I wasn't completely behind. 
but I, I, we did it anyway, and it was a huge success, and I was like, I got All proven right. wrong. Okay. So. <laughs> That's probably good, right? Yeah. So now you're going not to not only go with your gut, but like yeah. trust the people who are serving the folks who well, are Well, and that's the them. one thing. I mean, like the girls behind the bar right now, Tasha and Sharon, they've been with us. Sharon, Tasha's been with yeah. us forever. Um, she's a you know, smiling face. Everybody knows her. Everybody loves her. But I can bend her ear and say, what can we do better here? What can we do better in this unit of the company? over on the other side or then ask her about beers that she likes because again that's a whole dem- different demographic right. than some of the burly men on the other side that oh right. we want to make another IPA well right. let's see what these girls want and let's let's really look at a different aspect so, right so you're sort of tapping all, all angles really. oh yeah you have plus, to yeah because she's talking to the, the consumers who come in and maybe they'll ask for certain things mm-hmm. and they'll, she'll see the trends and maybe exactly. she'll Instagram with the kids and what they're drinking and yeah. stuff so we we're, were sort of talking earlier, like it was almost wish we hadn't recorded it, but we get into it. Like we had, you had uh, a bunch of super interesting things because you guys have been around for ten years now, right? Yes. So the tenth anniversary this year, or past tenth anniversary already? technically is St. Patrick's Day, twenty twenty. Right. It's September, yeah. September is when we were founded, I guess. Okay. So is this September would really be our tenth year in business. Yeah. But we use St. Patrick's Day as our. Smart. Yeah. Well. Excuse to throw up, buddy. Yeah. Oh, O'Connor. Irish, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why not? So. Uh, there's an interesting thing in beer that we, what we were just talking about was that a lot of the there's the sort of three essentially sort of categories of breweries there's the triple OGs the Sierra Nevada yep. Sam Adams and stuff like that every sort of country or state province has yep. those breweries then there's the new hype guys like some of the ones in Richmond the ones that have been around two, three, four years yep. making the hype beers getting the lines out the door every Saturday whatever yep. and then there's sort of where you fit in which is around the 10 year mark so you're not old you're not new but someone you said the other day referred to you as one of the older guys. Yeah. And you're like, what? Yeah. Like, so that is an interesting, I think it's a fascinating topic just because it's something that doesn't really get discussed enough as far as like, what does that mean for a brewery that's been around 10 years in this 2019 world? I think it's, it, it's a double edged sword, really. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's good because there's a lot of people out there that they can, we have reliable product, you know, good, clean, consistent product over and over. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it's the, the smaller guys that are flexible. Right. You know, when you back when we started, you were have you had to have a flagship beer. And you had to make that over and over again to be able to get into the, the grocery chains, and you had to get Which that. Was the game, right? Yeah, that was it. Well, that's all we had. Right. You know, we had to get our beer out because well, again, when we started, we didn't have we weren't allowed to have tasting rooms in Virginia. Right. So when did was, that change, by the way? Sorry, though. Gosh, about now about six years ago. Okay. So it's a. Uh, and again, once that bill, once that law got signed in, or that bill, or whatever, I'm not a lawyer or politician. Is, yeah, <laughs> yeah when it's, once it got signed into law, uh, that's when you saw an explosion in Virginia of craft beer openings. Right. And um, so, again, you, you could open up something as big as this tasting room and put a you know, one barrel system in and really have some fun with it. Right. Um, with us, again, it was a completely different thing. I think nowadays, you know, going, leading back onto the double-edged sword, I think a lot of the things right now is that the, I don't want to say the younger group, but the ones that are getting into craft now can perceive us as too big. Right. So why should we support them when they're already so big and they're, you can find their beer everywhere uh, versus why we're going to support the smaller, this perceived smaller guy because he just opened up and things like that. Um, I'm here to say it, and I, I've said it to a lot of my friends in the industry that there are big guys and there are small guys that don't make great beer. Um, I think we're all in it for the same reasons, and I enjoy stopping at all types of beers, whether it's Sierra Nevada or our friends down the street that are smaller that are making some fantastic beer because their attitudes are awesome, the way they present themselves as great, um, and I like that about it. I think uh, the challenges that our section has you know the the That's mid-size big. regional size yeah. is that you have the bigger guys uh the the sam adams especially sam adams but like well, the stones dogfish too, yeah. the dogfish is, uh, even like dogfish even when they were on their own the uh, the firestone walkers and, and things like that the ability to penetrate a market and and get share of mine because they are that big mm-hmm. uh, versus the flexibility of one that may be perceived smaller and more more local than I am. Um, they're getting they're getting that immediate share of mine of the consumer walking in off the street. 
the bigger guys are getting the share of mine from their wholesalers to push more more product. So that's that's the really the delicate balance. I call it the purgatory of craft beer. You know, we've, we're able to get to this point. And it's how do we edge up a little bit further than that just to kind of get a little breathing room, I guess. Right. Um, where, where would you say you guys are positioned in that? Because that's a really good point. Like, and we were talking about it earlier about the gateway of breweries. So I think you guys are much beyond the not I wouldn't consider you you have gateway beers yes but I wouldn't call you like a gateway brewery that only makes a certain type of you know like to take away the coolers and blood drinkers I think the uh, the gateway beer for us when we started this is still a blue collar town <laughs> uh, so we needed to make pale ales and red ales and stuff like that for everybody and that actually was what got us going um, it's making the cool fun unique beers and really having a lot of fun with it the the uh get the creativity juices flying that's what's really good and what i mentioned to you even off off air uh the little guys i was always enamored with my friends that had the flexibility uh the ability to make a beer you know a banana wit today and a hazy this tomorrow and a pastry stout the next day they make it once and it sells it sells if it doesn't they don't make it again we don't have that you know we got big big tanks over there we that so that's where i invested in a couple years ago and we put a seven barrel pilot system in uh our pilot system is bigger than some of the breweries you know (laughs) and i don't want to sound like i don't want to sound cocky or that (laughs) but it allows us because you know our taste room is big so it allows us to make beers just for here uh but also give us that extra uh, that longevity of people who can't get in there on that release day to come in and, and grab a beer right. and allow it at least give us that week for people to come in and try it and uh, we're still moving through a lot of that beer very very quickly uh, but it's really but what I love about it is it's really allowing the brewers just to have fun again and to get really creative and to uh, bend over backwards with a lot of different things this is my wife right here by the way Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. She works in the business too? She, yeah, she's the head of marketing. Nice. Yeah. Perfect. Is she sort of the one who sort of direct? Does she work, like we were talking before once again about social media and how you guys are really on point with that. So does she have a hand in that or is like... No, she does. Hire, like, she does. Hires? Yeah? Yeah. That's great. Um, she's uh, sh- she's the one who lit the fire. There was the proverbial shitter girl at the pot moment. Yeah. That was her. Right. So. so that was one of the things, like I said, I guess we're going to keep rehashing things we said before because yeah. it was actually a really good convo. Um but the you know the fact that you guys as well that Drew when I had was given like a list of, from multiple people about here's who you should hit up I'm like I didn't even know where to start because I really didn't have a gauge except for like two or three breweries yeah. and when I said, saw your Instagram I was like it's a brewery that takes itself seriously and I, I don't know for, for even if you think of it like that I'm looking for someone to interview to them for promote and, and sort of talk about this stuff and that's what drew me so imagine from a consumer wanting to drink exactly and they're going to have the same maybe even harsher yeah um, because I know that there's still a good good people behind the brewery even if their Instagram sucks yeah it could be great too and I need to decipher that but the consumer doesn't care like this is so it's like it's really cool that you guys have sort of that focus I mean you don't get this big well like we talked about I mean if you can't in in the the age of Instagram even Facebook if you can't grab that person's attention a with a picture or with emojis or whatever the hell I don't handle this by the way uh, yeah, of course so. you know and again I got friends of mine that I'm enamored with how well they do social media yeah. uh, because again for me perception can become reality if it's not already reality but again the more the shares get the more mindset that because again it's all about share of mind if you can get people's attention oh I gotta have that beer oh I gotta have this I love their space I love this whatever it is you're getting the people in and it's always me again goes back to the business aspect of it because I'm really trying to measure all that because if we're going to boost a post or we're going to do something and we're not selling beer then what the hell are we doing what's the flaw yeah yeah. so, so uh, social media is an interesting one is what we talk about a lot is that it, it's, it doesn't always uh, that we call it the gray area because it's not always a way to prove that that post or that person liking it or following yep. is going to result in them either coming a here dollar. or purchase a dollar yeah, in your exactly. pocket. So it's one of those things though, but if it's the same token, if you don't have a presence, then what does that cost you? Yeah. I feel like these people, a lot of Bruce is an interesting one because like you were talking, another thing earlier um, I love about the States is a much more of an entrepreneurial slash sort of business approach to beer, which I appreciate because while it's like nice to have the cloud head in the clouds, like creative, whatever, that's dope, but it's still a business, and you need to be able to make money. You need to 
grow that people sort of forget. Like we've had yeah. people specifically tell us we don't want to get too big, we just, and that's fine because everyone has varying aspirations. You don't have to be big to make money. No, it's got to, it still has to be a streamlined process and yeah. you're bringing people in for the most cost effective way. And, and technically, you don't have to even boost the post. Yeah, post on social and people can still come through. Yeah, I mean, I would like to see the next round of people come out that don't do any social media and see just win it, it just win it and. I will be that guy's fan. I tell you that. Do you know what? Some some of them, some of them, I think have achieved that. I can't think off the top of my head who, but I think that's also almost like it's an outlier. Have you versus... ever have you ever seen uh, Stillwater? He's from Baltimore. Yeah. Brian yeah. Strumke. Yes, yeah, so he's just he, he's yeah. the the nomadic brewer. And does he it's have like a this, gypsy brewer? Yeah, technically they call exactly. It, that doesn't gypsy have doesn't have a facility. No bricks and mortar. Uh, built a following on just showing up in Bruin and uh, I've always been a big fan of what he's done because that it, it is truly the less is more you know yeah. I mean, got his name out there he's, he's doing well his hand designs are yeah. like just light, like patterns and stuff I think he's in Belgium right now I think I just right. saw a post <laughs> I gotta, he's having a good time I gotta get off social media yeah. <laughs> or oh, maybe you gotta get on a wall yeah know. exactly maybe you should be out in Belgium I know right. Damn it, Brian. <laughs> bro that was a pleasure thank you we so done? much is there anything else you want to talk about? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> We've been doing this for like two hours, three yeah. hours. So. Yeah, about two hours. That's not bad. Not bad at all. Yeah. Um, so where can people find O'Connor online, on the internet? Oh, it's already going on, man. What's, do you know the Instagram and the website details? I don't. No? Tiffany will find it. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I just didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the episode, smash a thumbs up. Hit subscribe below. Hit the notification bell so you know when the new stuff drops. Follow us on social media at BOS Podcast. And check out the low form audio so you can hear very attractive gentlemen like Uncle Kevin right here talking about craft beer in Virginia. That is it, guys. Thank you for watching and listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Cheers. All right, bud.